U.S. UFO office arrow gets a new website and a new boss. In other news, the department is launching a website on the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office to provide the public with information concerning Arrow and its efforts to understand and resolve unidentified anomalous phenomena. The U.S.'s All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, the UFO Investigation Office, got a new boss and a new website. For immediate release, August 31st, 2023, the Department of Defense launches the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office website after only one year. Only took a year to make that happen. And now has a new boss. So Kathleen Hicks takes direct oversight of Pentagon's UAP office. New reporting website to be launched. So it was it was launched, but now we have a new boss. And that means that this guy, your favorite in mind, government bureaucrat, was fired, at least was removed. He was removed out of the link because before this was the actual boss for Arrow. If you remember back, and OUSDI, that was the office that Lou Elizondo really had an issue with. So in this video, we'll go through who is the new boss, Kathleen Hicks, does this change anything? And Arrow's new fancy website, including UAP reporting trends and actual cases. We'll also cover some black budget spending. Did you know we spent $52 billion on black budgets? This came out from Edward Snowden, the original whistleblower that you guys still don't really like, but man, this is what a whistleblower looks like when he's actually releasing information that the U.S. Department of Defense doesn't want to see and is still not allowed back. Think about that. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Thank you for being here. I'm Chris Lado, retired F-16 pilot. Now I investigate UAPs of all things and government transparency seems to be a major theme in that investigation. If you do like these videos, please smash that like button, share this video and subscribe to get future notifications. I release two videos a week on Tuesday and Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. That's what I try to do anyway. I'm getting back to a normal rhythm after being in Turkey. And if you wanna go further, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lado. You can get exclusive background content and help me come up with ideas for these videos. This is actually a patron idea for a video. Thank you to Mark, especially. I take no sponsorships. This is how I support the channel. You can also go to YouTube memberships to actually join there as a YouTube member. Thanks again for being here. Couldn't do it without you. Let's get to the video. Okay, first article, Hicks takes direct oversight of Pentagon's UAP office, new reporting website to be launched. In separate discussions over the last week, Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks and a Pentagon spokesperson briefed Defense Scoop on the near-term vision for the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. I love this, and a Pentagon spokesperson. That came out August 30th. There she is, Kathleen Hicks. She's Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks. She's been there since March 2021. Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks recently moved to personally oversee the Pentagon's unidentified anomalous phenomena investigation team, formerly known as the All-Domain Anomaly Re Resolution Office, formerly known, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Investigation Team. Okay, they changed the name again. I think it's still Arrow. Defense Scoop has exclusively learned and a new website will be launched where incidents can be reported. So that has happened. Let's look here. This is August 31st. So the next day, the Department of Defense launches the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office website. Dun, 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 the website. It's only been a year. Today, the department launched a website on the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office to provide the public with information concerning Arrow and its efforts to understand and resolve unidentified anomalous phenomena. Okay. This website will provide information, including photos and videos on resolved UAP cases as they are declassified and approved for public release. That's pretty awesome. The website's other content includes reporting trends and a frequently asked questions section, as well as links to official reports, transcripts, press releases, and other resources that the public may find useful such as applicable statutes and aircraft, balloon and satellite tracking sites. That all sounds great. If you remember back to April 2023, I believe April 16, 2023, Senator Gillibrand was not happy with Kirkpatrick's office, how they still had no way to actually report. There was no way to go to a website and file a report saying, I have seen this, here are my details to start collecting this data. That was the big issue coming out of that April meeting. And it seemed like Kirkpatrick 
was blaming a lot of his superiors, basically saying, we're trying to do that. <laughs> we're limited. We're having issues. We're not funded. We don't have the people, etc." So this fall, this release again says, consistent with section 1673 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023. So that's what's driving all of this, right? Is the Congress statement that they have to do this. Arrow will launch a secure reporting tool on the website to enable current and former U.S. government employees, service members, or contractors with direct knowledge of U.S. government programs or activities to contact Arrow directly to make a report. Okay, this still hasn't happened. Okay, let's look at their, let's look at the website, the fancy new website. Let's look at it here. This is arrow.mil, www.arrow.mil, the director's message. Let's watch this. From Sean, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, director. Welcome to the website for the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Our team of experts is leading the US government's efforts to address UAPs using a rigorous scientific framework and a data-driven approach. Since its establishment in July, 2022, Arrow has taken important steps to improve data collection, standardize reporting requirements, and mitigate the potential threats to safety and security posed by UAP. Well, data collection is not going very well. We look forward to using this site to regularly update the public about Arrow's work and findings and to provide a mechanism for UAP reporting. Thank you for visiting. Okay, so they have the mission here, which is this super complicated mission statement, minimize technical and intelligence surprise. That's that's the main, you could, you could remove everything else, right? Minimize technical and intelligence surprise. That's it. <laughs> by synchronizing scientific intelligence and operational detection identification. So by synchronizing all their collection efforts, attribution and and mitigating unidentified anomalous, phen anomalous phenomenon in the vicinity of national security areas. So that's all they're focusing on, right? Minimize technical and intelligence surprise. So it's not <laughs> release this information to the public. Their vision, unidentified anomalous phenomena are effectively and efficiently detect, track, analyze, and manage by way of normalized DOD intelligence community and civil business practices. So that's their vision, right? That they actually track these things, analyze them, and they manage them. Okay, what does that manage mean? Not tell the public about it? By adherence to the highest scientific and intelligence tradecraft standards and with the greatest transparency and shared awareness. So I do like this, greatest transparency and shared awareness. Okay, shared with who? And transparency for who? For the common citizen? All right, UAP means airborne objects that are not immediately identifiable, A, B, Transmedium objects or devices, and C, submerged objects or devices that are not immediately identifiable, and that, okay, display behavior or performance characteristics suggesting that the objects or devices may be related to the objects or devices described in subparagraph A or B. <laughs> okay, awesome. The DOD considers UAP as sources of anomalous detections in one or more domains, so airborne, seaborne, spaceborne, and or transmedium. Okay, good that are not yet attributable to known actors and that demonstrate behaviors that are not readily understood by sensors or observers. Okay, awesome. Anomalous detections include, but are not limited to phenomenon that demonstrate apparent capabilities or material that exceed known performance envelopes. Okay, anomalous detections. They're not limited to that. A UAP may consist of one or more unidentified anomalous objects and may persist over an extended period of time. Okay, great. So they kind of define it there. This reporting trend. So this is the best data that they've released. And it is good information. If you look here, basically it just has a breakdown of this and then it has all the other data here. Okay, but we can, gives us a better angle. So it does give the altitudes, remember this? So 20,000 feet. So between 10 and 30,000 feet is what they're saying, the bulk of their sightings. Typically reported characteristics, seen these before. Still always good to look at, right? Morphology is round, typical, right? Size is one to four meters. So you're looking at five to 15 feet around. Color is white, silver, translucent. 10 to 30,000 feet, I already mentioned that. Stationary to Mach 2, no thermal exhaust detected. That's quite interesting. An inter intermittent X-band, so radar. Basically you're getting hit in, the, this is fighter bands, eight to 12 gigahertz. Normally where you're, it's your um, higher frequency, it, it doesn't go very far through the atmosphere, but it's it, you can use a smaller transmitter, right? Because your wavelength's bigger, so you can fit it into missiles, in the front of missiles. So you're looking at radar, fighter radar is basically X-band. And then radio, okay? So it has fighter radar and down in the lower end. This is like your GPS or SAM systems.
So radar, this is intermittent X-band. So these are your fighter radars, essentially. And fighter radars, again, on your radio, plus GPS is one to three gigahertz, as well as your low band. This is like your um, SAM systems. So surface-to-air missile systems use a lower band. They can have bigger radars. Intermittent shortwave infrared and medium wave infrared. So also seen on infrared. So you're looking at seen visually, seen on radar, seen in radio, which is just a different freak, I guess. And then also seen in the infrared spectrum. So and also in infrared. So it's not just like some weird optical effect. Okay. So again, we've seen these before. I've blown out basically <laughs> better vision of this. Okay. That, that's the same. No updates on that. And then the hot points here, I've mentioned this several times that they're receiving no reporting from the Air Force is what my guess is. You're getting nothing from the Air Force because, you know, Navy operates in these areas. Navy sort does operate over here as well, you know, so and Navy. You're getting no European USAFE type events. There's nothing coming out of Europe on these events, That's what shows me. All right. So went through that quickly. All right. Coming soon. U.S. government UAP-related program activity reporting. Great. Arrow will be accepting reports one of these days from current or former U.S. government employees, service members, or contractors with direct knowledge of U.S. government programs or activities related to UAP dating back to 1945 because we are required to by the NDAA. That law is so awesome. These reports will be used to inform Arrow's congressionally directed historical record report. Okay. Congressionally directed. We'll announce when a reporting mechanism is available for others to use. Okay, so this goes all the way back to 1945. Congressionally directed historical record report where they're supposed to actually look and see what has happened in the past, everything. And will they still say there's no credible evidence for off-world technology? We'll see. This form is intended as an initial point of contact with Arrow. Uh, an email could also work. <laughs> Why not use an email? It is not intended for conveying potentially sensitive or classified information. Yeah, no shit. Following the submission of your report, Aero staff may reach out to request additional detail or arrange for an informational interview. Okay, but they have been saying this, and there's been bad rumors that they say you have to sign an NDA. You can't talk about anything that we've talked about. Again, are you going for transparency or not? Okay, and then they put this down here because I'd also seen and heard that Arrow was saying you'd have to sign an NDA, right? What was the point? Because we have right here, NDA fiscal year 2023, an authorized disclosure shall not be subject to a non-disclosure agreement entered into by the individual who makes the disclosure. Okay, so how, how can you have Arrow sign them an NDA if the Congress is saying there's no more NDAs, everybody? That's BS. Shall be deemed to comply with any regulation or order issued by the executive authority. And here it is, coming soon, the current operational UAP reporting. There it is. Military personnel should report through their commander service. And we've seen that that is a huge pain, right? That is a huge issue right now. Basically, from what I can understand is the military at the lower levels has gotten the message because they've been directed from above that you will report these UAP reports, right? You will report these events. It's part of your job. Unfortunately, as we learned through Matt Gates, when he talked to actually military members, is they're being stopped, right? The general of the base said, you will not talk to my, my pilots, right? Even though he's a congressional guy, <laughs> the general of the base said that to Congress. Think about that. You can't come in these rooms. We're limiting you. So how are they supposed to get the information? Matt Gates said that according to these pilots, what they said is the best thing to do if you see an e UAP is to forget about it and not release it because the, the mechanism to report is such a pain in the ass and you're already getting stigmatized against. I can relate to this firsthand. Why I would not go to get mental health help in the Air Force? is because, again, the whole reporting issue is a pain in the ass. As soon as you report something, now you're the target, right? Everyone just looks at you, and now they just attack you, as we're seeing in the news. Why are they not going attacking Grush's claims? What Grush is claiming is happening, right? Why not attack those? Nope, they're attacking the person. They go after the person. Same thing. Anytime someone sees a UAP, it's such a pain in the ass to report it. That they're not going to report it. This is why we need something like this, right? Outside of the normal realm. So they don't have to go through their normal chain of command. Because as you'll see when I go through and, and brief here about the whistleblower you guys don't like, Edward Snowden, 
He tried to go through his chain of command, but if there's no one there listening to you, then how are you going to report it? So it's still not here. They could just put an email and say, write to this email, right? Why not do that? That seems like the biggest thing you could do. Next, we get to cases. You won't see anything new here. All right. Same thing, go here. Click here for more information. Copyright, trademark. Thanks for that. This is the South Asian object, an MQ-9. So a Reaper, look with the push-pull that I'm talking about. Infrared video sensor captured this footage in South Asia as it was recording another MQ-9. So basically what they're saying is, is that this video uh, taken 15 Jan 23 is really just a distant airliner, right? That's an airliner. It looks like UAP, but since they're focused on this, I've covered that in a previous video. Here, they also like bringing this one out from a mission report. Okay, and what, what we find on this one is that there's many moving, right? They determine it's a, it's a distant aircraft. I'll let that run. It's just running. Yeah, we've actually seen this one. I haven't seen the full video, so I'll just play it here while I'm talking to it. I know they've just showed little clips of it. So I guess this is the full video of what they call as a UAP. Let's check it out. It says this is a civilian airliner. It looks like an airliner to me. If I just, if I look at it here, I see two engines and it's shape of an airliner. That moving back and forth, this is the sensor moving. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have any indication of where it's pointing. I think it's much better if you have something pointing. And these trackers, I don't know, these could be thermal, um, like tracking gates, like it's trying to track something there. It's trying to lock on it. I don't know what those are actually. It's an MQ-9 video. What we can learn from this though, is that A, it's not in color, right? So the MH370 that came out was in color. This is in obvious black and white. Looks like a normal infrared to me, like a medium wave infrared. The other thing is you'll notice there's no, besides a, an N up, there's really nothing telling you any information, right? And this just looks like a, a useless overlay. This doesn't tell me anything either, but they have, they did say this was an airliner. So we'll watch that through since it's, I guess the only new video that we have. Those are funny, but that shows you how fast it's going. So it is traveling, right? To me, it looks like a airplane. Okay. So I'm glad they, not, they nailed that one down. Let's see. After analysis, the full motion video, inclusion of additional footage with a longer focal length and analysis of commercial flight data in the region, Aero assesses that the object likely is a commercial aircraft and that the trailing cavitation is a sensor artifact resultant of video compression. The trailing cavitation. Okay. Yeah. They could have also just asked a pilot. You know, I could have told you in a few minutes or a few seconds or looking at that, that it looks like an airplane. I mean, uh, where are the other 754 accounts? Okay, we've seen this one as well. Let's see. Nice. So that's a link right to the DVID. So I do like how they're they're getting the information out. I mean, it's on here now. At least there's a place we can go and be like, look, here's the videos that they released. Okay, this one, again, July 22. And that's confusing, right? As I go back. Hmm. Can't pause it. I'll just play this one through while I talk again. It's confusing is that it says this, the mission report is July 22, from July 2022. Why is it frozen? That's it, that's all they gave us. So it'd be nice to have the full video on here. Maybe if we go here, we get the full video. There we go. Okay, this one says from mission report, 775-0816, 12 July 22. Okay, but then it gives this Zulu time that's at night. If you're talking about Iraq, this is also at night. So. Is that when the mission report came in? When was the video actually filmed? So I'll play this one again. It's on the on the list. Always good to see. And this is that silver object. From Iraq, interesting. And they give us 24 seconds. I thought the original video was longer, but that, that makes sense, I guess. And it gives some more information here. This clip was taken by an MQ-9 in the Middle East. And while Arrow assesses the object in the clip is not exhibiting anomalous behavior, the object remains unidentified. Interesting when you go back to those objects that they're seeing, right? 
And if we go back and look, that's like your common object that's round, silver. It's in that medium altitude band. It's probably stationary at this point, no thermal exhaust, and they're picking it up. I wonder if they picked it up on other information and they definitely picked it up on optical. Did they pick it up on infrared? That would be interesting. We didn't get to see it from there. UAP video, Western US objects, analysis of the full motion video, video combined with commercial flight data in the region led Aero to assess that the objects were three commercial aircraft flying at a great distance from the sensor. Yeah, I, again, that seemed that seemed like what I thought initially, okay? And again, these overlays, you're gonna get a lot more information if you actually have the overlay. Uh, you know, I do like this, it's not classified. But when they're all moving together like that, it tells me the sensor's moving. Okay, except this is moving now. But you'll see even that will move. See how this is moving in relation to these three as he's moving the sensor? So I see these are like in a line that looks like they're in a straight line. And this looks like a jet in the cons, in the contrails, uh, further away. So I don't know. I wouldn't classify this as a, as a UAP, to be honest. I mean, but we'll see if it's more interesting. So we have clouds, quite interesting. Distant objects. I bet you can count the flashes there and see that it's an airline. Okay, so I mean it's something. I would say it's not doesn't really even need to be on this. This does though. Let's check this out. This video captured by the pilot in the cockpit of a Navy fighter jet demonstrates the typical speed at which military aircraft. Okay. Videos on this as well. And this again kind of looks like that silver sphere, right? As it goes by, boom. Where's that silver sphere up at altitude? How to get there? Quite interesting. That's off the East Coast. So gimbal, you're looking at those. Navair unresolved case. So this is the FLIR video. 116. I was I wondered if it had any additional time at the beginning. I think it's the same length as the original FLIR. What it goes to show is this thing is being tracked, right? They're tracking it when it's in like this weird looking orb state thing. So what is that? And then he goes to the IR. So I, it looks like the same video. 116, I didn't remember FLIR being that long, but that's quite interesting. Okay, so the FLIR video, good to see it there. We have, and then we have the gimbal video of unexplained anomalous phenomena. So they don't say anything there and then go fast. Go fast now, they said it was a balloon that came out, at least NASA, one of, one of NASA's guys said it was a balloon. They gave the same argument that Mick West gave. All right. You can go to their leadership. You can read about Dr. K here. If you're interested, leave that up. I've covered it before and their mission overview. He has this slide doc, this kind of interesting slide doc as well. This was given to, uh, I believe this was the one they also gave it NASA, if I can remember correctly. So here he has some stuff. It, it doesn't mean unattributed balloon activity. This is right when the balloons were getting shot down. What he says is it's awareness gaps. That's what UAP is. Basically we have these gaps on our intelligence networks and they are potentially advanced capabilities operating in our domain awareness gap. So it's just that we can't see them because we're not looking enough. And that's what he's saying that the, the balloons were effectively. This is what fiscal year 2023 did, led the government effort, amends the structures, blah, 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 adds a historical report. Yeah, R historical record report. So the government can't just be saying we didn't do anything in the past. What about, what about solace? What about all the nuclear incidents that happened? What about the investigations of Project Blue Book? What about all the ATIP investigations? Everything going back all the way to 1945. This is their mission, vision, and functions, talking about what they hope to do, essentially. Yeah, I read through it. And this is where they're looking like worldwide. This is kind of interesting. So US territory and operating areas, they want to work with the DOD, the intelligence community, the DOJ, NASA, and the FAA, right? This is the key stakeholders. So now US strategic capabilities, as we get further away, proximity to strategic capabilities and critical infrastructure 
right? Your historical stuff. That's all through DOD, inter, um, intelligence community, DOE now, Department of Energy is looking at your historical accounts. NNSA, I don't even know what that is, but I'm guessing the NSA, the DOJ and the Department of Homeland Security. So they need to look at those. And then foreign territory. Now you're looking at IC state international partners. They talk about here, their integration strategy. I've, I've read through all of this stuff. I mean, from what I understand is basically is how can they get the information about a UAP and use it for the military industrial complex own use? That's kind of what I got out of this is, yeah. How can they lead a recovery, right? UAP object recovery leads UAP recovery planning and execution in close collaboration with Aero s and Group. So it's really the Aero s and Group that's going out for crash retrieval, right? UAP recovery. There we go. How do they handle and safe storage? So how do you retrieve it? Then once we retrieve it, then we can mitigate it. We can detect and track. So this is just your military standard stuff, right? What is he going to do? That's what he knows as an intelligence operative. How are they going to analyze it? This is where he talked through his six steps. Remember, he briefed his six steps. We're going to have scientific analysis, then intelligence, analytic peer review, then I'll look at as the director, and then we'll publish it. Okay, none of that has so far happened. And by the way, does it ever go to, where does it actually go to the people, right? <laughs> Publication and feedback. I guess they're going to publish it here. That would be awesome. Capabilities development. How can they exploit it? Capability gap idea. Again, it's that integrated science and technology strategy, SNI. All right. And here's how they're going to publish it, right? Strategic communications. American public engagement implements departments of transparency and openness on UAP matters. Implements the department's commitment to transparency and open uh, openness on UAP matters. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. Office goals and priorities. I read through all of these. It's basically, yeah, you can read through those if you want to pause it. And that's his uh, briefing. It's pretty much all the information they have on the website so far. I still haven't clicked on this. Congressional reports. So you can click their final reports. There it was, open hearing April 19th. This is the transcript from April 19th. This is the video. And then they have the presentation. In 2022, there was the report to the ODNI, Office Director of National Intelligence, transcript. This was super late, by the way. It's supposed to be in October. It came. And this is 2021, the June report. All right. So good news on that is they have a website. Will it do anything to change anything? Well, I think the biggest change that we saw is not even from the website. Uh, yes, I agree. It is good to see the website. But I think we got a website because... This guy was effectively fired. Okay, Ron Moultrie, he is head of the Undersecretary of Defense and Intelligence. So he's the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. That is O Office of USDNI, NS. Okay, if you remember that from something specific, yes, that's right. Lou Elizondo, that was his big fight, was against this office in particular. There's just one email. This is take page 24 of a whole section taken. Uh, from John Greenwald's Freedom of Information Act request. This is why, again, I like John Greenwald because he's out there getting us actual data. So from that Freedom of Information Act request, and again, the FOIA requests suck, right? They're supposed to keep people's identity secret while not releasing secret information, but they can't do any of that correctly. So here we go. This is from August 27th, 2021. Apologies for not seeing you this month, sir. This is from Lou Elizondo. I will try for some time late September to meet again with your investigators, auditors at a time of their convenience. In the meantime, I thought you might find the below link interesting. As a result of a recent FOIA request, it appears that Pentagon Public Affairs Office is still publicly stating I had no assigned responsibilities for ATIP during my time at OUSDI. That's it, the Office of Undersecretary Defense and Intelligence. Clearly, they still do not acknowledge my role and addressing the public in this manner is disingenuous because it appears that I had no responsibilities at all. Hopefully during your efforts, you have a much clearer picture by now. I was given a job to do at the Pentagon, and now they pretend I didn't do the job I was asked to do. It is a feeling of betrayal by certain individuals I can't begin to explain. That was in 2021. And that's it. That's the office. O-U-S-D-N-I. That is what Lou Elizondo said is the is a big problem with this. Okay, the Office of Undersecretary of Defense and Intelligence for Security is a high-ranking civilian position in the office of the Secretary of Defense. So this is where it gets confusing. I was trying to look on my own. Where is it? So inside the office of the Secretary of Defense is this guy, okay? Ronald Moultrie. 
And what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to be the principal staff element of the DOD for all matters regarding intelligence, counterintelligence, security, sensitive activities, and other intelligence and security related matters. As the SecDef's representative to the intelligence community, he exercises oversight over really the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Agency, the National Security Agency, and the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Moultrie also serves as the Undersecretary for the Director of Defense Intelligence under the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. So it's, it's super confusing, but what it looks like is this office or this guy in particular and his office are not getting anything done. They're blocking at the very least because Kirkpatrick has requested it. Basically, they're not happy with what Moultrie's been doing. He's effectively been fired. Hicks formally established Arrow via an official memorandum last year after lawmakers mandated its creation in the fiscal 2022 National Defense Authorization Act. So this is Kathleen Hicks since February 8th, 2021. The Deputy Secretary of Defense is a statutory office and the second highest ranking official in the Department of Defense. The Deputy Secretary is the principal civilian deputy to the Secretary of Defense and is appointed by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate. Hicks is the first woman to serve in this role. So she took over and she originally assigned actually the arrow to be created. And it looks like she's not happy with how it's gone as we shouldn't be happy with it. It hasn't released anything in a year, essentially still has no way to report. That was the biggest issue that Kristen Gillibrand had during both Kirkpatrick's and the whistleblowers hearings. A, a visible point of contention that came up was associated with Arrow's seemingly delayed delivery of the fiscal 2023 NDA mandated website and UAP reporting mechanism. The legislation set a June deadline for the online portal to be supplied by the office. That was June of this year even, and still did not happen. Kirkpatrick, he told lawmakers at the review in April, review hearing in April, that his team submitted the first version of that before Christmas, but he was still waiting on input from superiors at the time. So when nothing happened by the end of June, looks like they were fired. Moultrie was fired, and now the office actually moved up directly under Kathleen Hicks, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Hicks was not provided with the website materials until late July, which is when she got involved and took personal oversight over the project, Defense Scoop confirmed. Okay, where was the holdup? Again, bureaucratic malfeasance. <laughs> and Moultrie can just claim he didn't do anything right, because following Moultrie's approval, Arrow worked with its IT contractor to refine a prototype website according to the timeline. That month, this is in May, the Joint Staff also separately published a Gen Admin message on UAP reporting and material disposition that offers guidance to the military services and commands about reporting UAP worldwide using a standard reporting template. The template is a result of work Arrow has pursued with military leaders to improve and standardize reporting procedures across the force since its inception. And like I said at the beginning, that is going horribly because Matt Gates said the, the best thing you can do if you see a UAP is to forget about it and not report it. That's where they're at right now. Then two months ago, on June 27, Kirkpatrick's team delivered an overview of the prototype website to the DOD's Deputy General Counsel for Intelligence and others. During that briefing, the Intel lawyers identified several privacy and records management requirements that Arrow needed to address before releasing the secure reporting mechanism portion. So that's exactly where they hold it up, as they always hold it up, is they're going to say, this has some issue with privacy and records management. It's going to have security issues. We're not going to be able to put that up there. We couldn't just have an email and ask people to contact us because that would cause too many privacy issues. Meanwhile, the NSA has no problem looking at all of your communications of everyone in the whole world, which goes into, is this going to change anything? Is it really going to change anything? And maybe let's look, let's look at how our, probably the biggest whistleblower we could name right now is treated. And that is Edward Snowden. Yes. Controversial. Many of you think he has done incorrect, illegal things. Now he's a Russian citizen. He actually joined Russia. So he's obviously the enemy, but, but is he? So let's look at this. Edward Snowden, this is from 2012. This was the budget for 2012, the actual black budget. The black budget of the U.S. Intel, the U.S. was $52 billion in 2012. $52 billion. Imagine that. That's, that's way more than most countries spend. And this is just the black budget it's released, again, leaked by Snowden. So where does that go? $14.7 billion goes to the CIA. What are they normally doing? 
exploiting information, analyzing and managing facilities and support. And they're probably not gaining any, they're not data collecting, are they? Oh, look, there's a big red line here, data collection from the CIA. So $14.7 billion, that's probably most of it. What it's used is for data collection. There you go. National Security Agency, 10.8 billion. NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, 10.3 billion. National Geospatial, 4.9 billion. Defense Intelligence Program, never heard of that, 4.4 billion. Justice Department, they need black budget money, $3 billion. Wonder what that does. And then other, another $4.5 billion in black budget money, just going somewhere else, other. Wonder what I could do with $4.5 billion a year. And by the way, this is in 2012. How many hundreds of billion dollars is this worth now? If it was $52 billion in 2012, we're talking over a decade later. And why is this secret? Is it Should it really be secret that we can't tell as American taxpayers where the money is going, if it's going to black budget funding? And this is a whistleblower, okay? He was original whistleblower. And I know a lot of people, including the guy who came up with the idea for this, for Mark, I know you're not a big fan of Edward Snowden, but Edward Snowden released all of the information on Look at this. His disclosures revealed numerous global surveillance programs, global mass surveillance programs, many run by the NSA and the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. I've talked trash about the Five Eyes. If you remember, the Five Eyes goes back to UAP recovered technology back in the 40s, literally 1947. Five Eyes are on a lot of those papers. Intelligence Alliance with the cooperation of telecommunication companies, of course, and European governments, right? Which we've seen a lot of censorship coming down the pipe in European governments and prompted a cultural discussion about national security and individual privacy. That is correct. If you go to this Wikipedia page, link in the description, it gives all the information you basically need about Snowden, okay? Initially, he started as special forces. Did you know that? To be a special forces fighter, like many other heroes have supposedly done in the past. Like many people that go into special forces, he was knocked out because of some medical issue. Usually your body breaks or something going through program. That's usually what happens a lot of the time. Then he went to the CIA, right? Employment at the CIA, this is where he kind of started his road, I guess, to the dark side, depending on your looks. But as we look here in March, 2007, the CIA stationed Snowden with diplomatic cover in Geneva, Switzerland. He was in charge of computer networks. Okay, this is where he said he had a different name. He was under a different task. Supposedly, he was considered top technical and cybersecurity expert in that country, was handpicked by the CIA to support the president at the 2008 NATO summit in Romania. Snowden described his CIA experience in Geneva as formative. Here it is, stating that the CIA deliberately got a Swiss banker drunk and encouraged him to drive home. Snowden said that when the latter was arrested for drunk driving, a CIA operative offered to help in exchange for the banker becoming an informant. And that basically, it's just one guy saying, this can't be true. That would mean that they success, the CIA successfully bribed the police and judiciary. With all due respect, I just can't imagine it. You can't imagine someone bribing. I've seen it with my own eyes. It happens in literally every country. Okay, in 2009, that's when Snowden left the CIA. And then from then on, he went to work for Dell in 2009. This is when he got downloaded most of the information. Okay, now we get through the he said, she said. She said, he said. Someone said, basically, Snowden says that he tried to, to go up the chain. Snowden elaborated in January 2014, saying, I made tremendous efforts to report these programs to coworkers, supervisors, and anyone with the proper clearance who would listen. The reactions of those I told about the scale of the constitutional violations ranged from deeply concerned to appalled, but no one was willing to risk their jobs, families, and possibly even freedom to go to jail through what Drake did. And that's the big issue, isn't it? I had an interview with John Greenwald two weeks ago where he argues that the whistleblowers should just come forward. They should just give out their information, release the information, because if it's shown to be so illegal that the U.S. is actually holding a secret program where they're going around the world and collecting information, collecting alien artifacts, if you will, information, bringing them back and using it as an advantage, and meanwhile, lying and keeping it secret, doing whatever they can to keep it secret, then of course, these people would be seen as heroes and brought out and nothing would be done to them. Except that has just happened, literally just happened right here with Edward Snowden. He sees the National Security Agency, the NSA, basically copying everyone's information, everyone. 
the ongoing publication of leaked documents has revealed previously unknown details of a global surveillance apparatus run by the United States NSA in close cooperation with three of its four Five Eye partners. I mentioned that before. Guess what? Australia, the UK's GCHQ, and Canada's CSEC. What happened to New Zealand? Probably just too honorable. The first program to be revealed was PRISM, which allows for court-approved direct access to Americans' Google and Yahoo accounts, reported from both the Washington Post and The Guardian, published one hour apart. Hmm, look at that. How would you like that, that some random secret judge could be approving all of your Google and Yahoo accounts to be compromised? Reports also revealed details of Tempra, a secret British surveillance program run by the NSA's British partner, GCHQ. The initial reports included details about NSA call database, boundless informant, and of a secret court order requiring Verizon to hand the NSA millions of Americans' phone records daily, daily. Think of that. And you can say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. Why would anyone bother with me? The government, of course, would never worry about me or hassle me. It's like, really? Based on our latest revelations, they can do whatever they want. It, if it's behind secrecy, no one, you don't even know that they're doing it. They don't even, you don't even know that there's a court order that a judge is looking at. Should we look at all of Chris Lato's information and track all of his correspondence? That seems okay, right? The NSA's top secret black budget obtained from Snowden by the Washington Post exposed the successes and failures of the 16 spy agencies comprising the U.S. intelligence community and revealed that the NSA was paying U.S. private tech companies for clandestine access to their communication networks. The agencies were allotted $52 billion for the 2013 fiscal year. It was revealed <laughs> that the NSA was harvesting millions of email and instant messaging contact lists, searching email content, tracking and mapping location of cell phones so your cell phone is known undermining attempts at encryption via bull run, and that the agency was using cookies to piggyback on the same tools used by internet advisors, advertisers to pinpoint targets for government hacking and to bolster surveillance. The NSA was shown to be secretly accessing Yahoo and Google data centers to collect information from hundreds of millions of account holders worldwide by tapping undersea cables using the muscular surveillance program. Oh, great. That's an awesome one. Thanks, UK. The NSA, the CIA, and GCHQ spied on users of Second Life, Xbox Live, and World of Warcraft and attempted, attempted to recruit would-be informants from the sites, according to documents revealed in December 2013. I mean, this is funded with your American U.S. taxpayer dollars. This is literally the money they're taking from you that they make you give them, by the way, that they make you give them is being used for these programs, right? Do you support these types of programs? Are you okay with that, that there's... NSA, CIA, and GCHQ spies on Xbox Live. Like, what are they talking to your son? Are they talking to your kids while they're playing World of Warcraft, Second Life, trying to recruit you? Recruiting terrorists to what? Be informants? Is this really what we want our, our funds being used for? And then we're surprised when we have negative outcomes, right? When you have a terrible outcome in the end because you're lying and cheating and stealing all over the world, how can you come back to your country and say, oh, Citizens, what I need you to do is to not lie. Tell us where all of your money is so that we can take it, a certain percentage of it that will dictate the percentage, and then use it for however we want. And by the way, we don't have to tell you how we're using it because we have black budget programs set up. And when was all of this created? When was all of it created? And for the argument that it really hurt national overseas, let's see. Panel member Jeffrey Stone, this is the presidential panel, said there was no evidence that the bulk collection of phone data had stopped any terror attacks. Look at that. There's no evidence it had stopped any terror attacks. Court rulings. Let's go through uh, court rulings. Judge Leon referred to the NSA's almost Orwellian technology and ruled the bulk telephone metadata program to be likely unconstitutional. Likely unconstitutional. Leon's ruling was stayed pending an appeal by the government, meaning Snowden was vindicated. On June 11th, the ACLU filed a lawsuit against James Clapper, DNI. He was actually at the whistleblower hearing, alleged that the NSA's phone records program was unconstitutional. In December, 10 days after Judge Leon's ruling, Judge Pauly came to the opposite conclusion. Although acknowledging that privacy concerns are not trivial, Pauly found that the potential benefits of surveillance outweigh these considerations and ruled that the NSA's collection of phone data is legal. Look at that. It's okay if they can literally tap all of your information without you knowing. Okay, there's some other ones against Clapper, but here you go. 
On September 2nd, 2020, a U.S. federal court ruled that the U.S. intelligence mass surveillance program exposed by Edward Snowden was illegal and possibly unconstitutional. Possibly unconstitutional. They also stated that the U.S. intelligence leaders who publicly defended it were not telling the truth. They're lying right there. This is from, from a judge, a U.S. federal court. There we go. What happens to the whistleblower? He is stuck in Russia, can't come back to the U.S., why doesn't he just come back? Why doesn't he come back and face the music? That's the best question, right? Obama suggested a few days prior, Snowden, why doesn't he just come back and face the music? And what Snowden says is what he doesn't say are the crimes he's charged me with are crimes that don't allow me to make my case. They don't allow me to defend myself in an open court to the public and convince a jury what I did was to their benefit. It's not possible. So it's, as I would say, illustrated that the president would, would choose to say someone should face the music when he knows the music is a show trial, meaning... He can't face the real music. He's just going to come back so they can put him in jail. Okay, finally, let's go to the black budgets. So interesting here, I guess, decentralized information, right? Look at France. They have a $70 million black budget. Russia is 21% of their budget's black budget. So is that how you determine how authoritarian your state is by how black the budget is? Spain has some black budgets they don't talk about. Turkey has black budget, $16.5 and let's get to the United States. $30 billion in 2008, $50 billion in 2009, and then $52.8 billion, as Snowden said back in 2012. What is it now? I wonder what, how many hundreds of millions is the black budget now, and where is that money going to? And all of this, so sketchy to me, is how was it approved? All of this was approved this budget, the black budget, by the U.S. National Security Act of 1947, which created the Central Intelligence Agency, that doesn't cause us any issues, the National Security Council, and recognized some military bases with the help of the Defense Department, also created the U.S. Air Force, again, in the black budget, all back to the National Security Act of 1947, which came right after World War II and a few months after Roswell after Roswell. Can you imagine? The whole thing's just, just so sketchy. And I would argue is all those illegal activities, lying never helps. Okay. Lying is not going to help. And you can say, we need to have spies. Everybody lies. You don't have to lie. If you lie, you will end up being in the same situation that we've been in the past, right? How can you have a military industrial complex that's out there lying, infiltrating all of our media organizations, changing the media, changing propaganda, paying these large, huge, large budgets to work with our telecommunications companies so that they can back engineer information technology that can just steal all of our, inf all of our information. Meanwhile, not having any transparency, right? As we're requesting UAP FOIA requests, now they're coming back as denied. There's nothing else. Ah, what do you guys think? I think first we need to dig to the bottom of this whistleblower issue. They need to pardon Edward Snowden and realize that he gave an insight into how messed up the military industrial complex is. And if you look at all those same organizations, what did I mention? The same organizations that we're talking about with UAPs were involved in this, right? The NSA, the CIA, advanced technology elements of the NRO, communication industries. So, I mean, it could easily be hidden under a separate program, weeded in UAPs with all of this lying and cheating and stealing. It's not going to help you in the long run. It helps you in the short run. Short run, lying and cheating and stealing does help you in the short run. But in the long run, it's going to degrade your democracy because now you have to lie to your citizens. You have to lie to us. But it looks like it could be changing with these new presidential candidates, man, on both sides. Super excited. I'm hearing RFK Jr. and Vivek Ramaswamy, however you say his name, saying the right things about all this stuff. So maybe we can see something actually break. But for now, at least Moultrie is out of the game. But the good news is for now is at least I don't have to worry about this guy anymore. He came in right after Snowden. Okay, so he took over after Snowden to actually clean up. And what happened after that? We still have terrible, terrible functioning or malfunctioning bureaucracies. We can't get any information. Arrow can't even get a website up. Okay, but as soon as they swap over, swap to Kathleen Hicks, now they have a website getting information out. It'd be great if Arrow could actually come up with an email, just post an email, how we can actually report. I'm sure they have to deal with other bureaucratic terrorism out there. And by the way, these guys can get anything that done they want. Okay. If they want to focus on something, guess what? It happens immediately. It happens over the weekend. This whole, we can't get it done for months and months and months at a time means this guy did not care, did not give one inkling of support to this. 
because he thinks it's not worth it. But guess what? You're out of it. Removed from the list. So now we'll see Kathleen Hicks. I was impressed with her initial speaking on it. I did a video a couple, couple years back on the JWST and John Ramirez. I was impressed with her words on the topic. She said extraterrestrial, if you remember. So can she push through? Is there any sort of oversight of our DOD? Do we actually have civilian oversight of the DOD and, the, and our spy agencies, our 16 plus spy agencies out there that are actually spying on us as well? And what are they using that information for? Who knows? All right. Thanks for being here, everyone. Please smash that like button if you did like this content and then share this, get the information out. That really helps. Subscribe to get future notifications of my videos. You can always go further. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. And now you can become a YouTube member. You can support the channel and get early access to videos and exclusive content as well. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Peace.